And with that out of the way, um, let's welcome Anthony Chen, um, speaking today about light cones and power law interacting systems. So please, Anthony. Uh, hello. So recently, these power law interacting system has attracted a lot of attention. And, and there are a lot of development also. People care, seem to care a lot more about them. And it is, this talk will be about a review, up-to-date up review of all these things. So, so I'm, I'm personally involved in one of the few development and the upper one would be the main theme of this talk with a lot of collaborators. But also I personally work with uh, a first proof of light cone in long range interacting system in 1D. Okay. okay. So let me tell you about this, the theme or the style of this talk. It's going to be a review. We will talk about that there are several notions of light cones, in fact, a hierarchy of them. So these would be several theoretical bounds. Okay, and really, really a lot of them, and, and especially within the past, past year. There are also, we also talk about the physics state constraints. So there are protocols, some explanation of what they mean. Okay. Although there are a review of quite a lot of results, I'll make this uh, summary plots. But I'll try to give, also give the unifying key intuitions be behind the physics of these long range systems. Okay. I'll, I'll not go into every detail of the proofs because there are so many of them, but I'll try to sketch the essential ideas. Okay, and we should all have a taste of the physics of parallel systems. And as in all talks about these uh, Lee Robinson bounds, we have to start with the local Hamiltonian, and perhaps you have attended hundreds of these talks but bear with me. Okay, so we have some local Hamiltonian and what's the physics? And it, okay, so usually, again, I have to talk about these Lee Robinson bounds, is, is what captured these locality, okay? So this object is the so-called uh, commutator. So there's a commutator here, okay? So it, it, it stands for the time evolution of an operator. Okay, with some with the Hamiltonian that we start with, and we commute with something perhaps within the light cone or without or outside the light cone, and then ask how big that that is. So, but so the Robinson told us that is going to be suppressed exponentially outside. Okay. And to put this commutator in the context, usually we call this as causality. So in, in relativity, this, this commutator showed up already. And it states that if you have two events that's um, space-like separated, they could not be causal. And that's reflected in this commutator known vanishing, this commutator vanishing, okay. And okay, but it's not the case that we don't have an exact vanishing um, thing here, but it's pretty nice already. We have some exponential detail. Okay. And again, we are in some condensed matter system with a bunch of atoms, like a piece of graphene or just any kind of material. It is interesting that you get some some other velocity outside, which is different, usually different from the speed of light. So for graphene, it's, I believe it's something like 300 over C. So you can get this speed of uh, signaling strictly using only the Hamiltonian, but not relativity, okay? And we can try to interpret this commutator. It's sometimes a bit uh, crazy because what this means. And suppose we're trying to do some experiment, we start with some state row, and after a while, we want to measure uh, some operator. Okay. And due to this light cone, 
Okay, we can backtrack it. And in real life, we can kind of remove all the degree of freedom outside of the light cone. Okay. And keep only the shaded area. And you and the Lee Robinson theorem tell you we will not be losing too much. Okay. But, but perhaps we want to work in the Schrodinger picture because sometimes this operator is a bit um, not intuitive. So suppose I have some qubits here and there is my qubit of interest. Okay, and the rest are just zeros. And after some time, I wonder how, how is this information spread out in the qubits? And is it contained within the light cone? Okay. So this is the, the Schrodinger picture. And to probe this, suppose I try to um, change the qubit that's slightly outside the light cone. Okay. And to interpret this to um, by in order to, to use the Robinson bounds, we we have to introduce this another uh, U dagger. Okay. This by looks up, but this allows us to con convert to the Lee-Rosen theorem, okay? So once we apply this U dagger, then it's nice that this piece just becomes X of T. This is, this is becomes a Heisenberg picture. And there we know there's a light cone, okay? So since this operator will be supported um, on the left three qubits, it's not going to touch our the qubits of interest we have, okay? up to some small error, okay. So in this sense, you realize that your, your, your quantum information is kind of encoded in, in within a light cone, um, okay, starting from your qubit, the qubit you have. Okay. So here by this cartoon, all I want to say, all I want to say is just that um, this, it takes it takes some effort to translate between this Heisenberg picture and Schrodinger picture, but they're but in the intuition they're all kind of saying just draw this light cone and things behave what you expect. Okay. Okay, and there are in fact a lot more physics you can derive just using this bound. There's this exponential decay of ground state correlation, stability of phase, this matrix product state representation efficient digital quantum simulation, there are almost all of these proofs use the realms of bounds. And who also looks like we'll understand a lot of these local physics. And now we can try to turn on parallel interaction and ask how much of these persists. Namely, would there be a Lee Robinson bounds? And and if not, or it and if yes or no, they will both be interesting. Okay. Okay. So here it would be the Hamiltonian of interest today. So between each site, there's going to be a R to the R to the alpha interaction. So it's going to be all to all in some sense. Although the, the these there's this parallel exponent alpha. Okay, so if alpha is super big, or you can take the infinite limit, then the model is just by definition local. Okay, but on the other extreme, if alpha equal to zero, then all pairs of qubits are treated equally. Okay, then 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 there's no this geometric structure we don't, and we shouldn't think of it as the lattice. But the question is what happens in between and what are the critical parameters or just critical values of alpha such that the physics drastically change. Okay. And we can do some naive calculation and see that dimension must have come in, must come in on this line. Okay. So if we calculate a single site energy, okay, and it probably scales by R to the D minus alpha. So if alpha is too small, 
then this diverges, namely, and then the system would be um, non-extensive. So it would, the energy would not be proportional to the volume, but it will kind of diverge, okay? And, okay, so, so there's definitely some point here. It's that alpha equal to D and something should happen when the single side energy diverge. And, but today we will focus more on this part. Okay, what happened between alpha equal to D and alpha equal to infinity? And in the following animation, I want I would like to have some intuition of what these long range interaction are doing. Okay. So suppose I have two sites that are separated by some distance. Okay. And if I don't have this long range interaction by this low, this uh, classically Robinson bound, the information is going to spread out. And it would take about linear time to hit the target, okay? This is just by using these local hops, okay? And, but if we treat this uh, long range interaction as some per per perturbation in this process, namely when our local interaction is spreading the operator, we allow this long range interaction to help. And what's going to happen? So as our operator gets bigger and bigger, okay, there are going to be more and more of these long range interaction that could help in the process. Okay, so this this sphere, this sphere is growing about with radius O of t, and all of these um, these terms within the, the the ball would would help, okay. and they could be kind of scattering around our target. And so long as they're not too far away from our target, they could they could all be concentrated into our target. Okay. Of course, this is just hand wavy, but just do this naive um, estimates. There's two integral to do. We integral over a volume, so it's like r to the d, it's, and there's another r to the d. And if you multiply that by the interaction strength and also the time, you get this estimate is, is how much the long range interaction has helped when the short range has hit the target. Okay. And this expression would be bigger than one which means a long range has more somehow more contribution than a short range one if alpha is smaller than 2d plus one. And it will be smaller than one and in fact uh, vanishing if alpha is greater than 2d plus one. Okay. So this calculation, in fact, we show up many times and it is one of the quite uh, a few per important parameters that characterize the system, these long range interacting systems. Okay. Okay, so there seems to be this important point somewhere on this line. And let me lay out the roadmap for this, the plan for today. So I'm, I tell you that there is going to be several notions of light cone, not only the Libramson one. There will also be this OTOC, some other notion of light cone, which was defined differently. And I will also tell you a bit about the single particle um, bound. Okay. And each of them is going to have their own this diagram and the, their own different uh, values of alpha characterizing different physics. And moreover, I'll also tell you what these light cone constraints. Okay, so for the Lee-Ramson and bounds, it would constrain certain kinds of state trans transfer. Okay, so for example, you can it is constraining uh, preparing a 
GHZ state, some entangled state. And for the other notions of light cone, it constrains something different, something more special. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about more of this later. But just that there will, there will be different physics that they constrain, different information processing task. Okay, I want to pause a bit here to ask if the roadmap is clear. Okay, if not, um, let's move on to the Lee Robinson part. So I will start with this guy. So let's be, be careful about, about the, what the Lee Robinson bound is actually calculating. So we have this commutator and we also take the infinity norm. It's okay. So this norm means we, we, we are taking the largest singular value of whatever input. Okay. And this is also equal to maximize um, over all possible input state. So it really is the worst case bound. And for example, if you have a poly operator and a projector, they would both evaluate to one. Although for the poly case, the, the, the eigenvalues are pretty, are all evenly, are, are all pretty flat, they're all pretty big. But for the projector, there are a lot of zeros. But the norm we're choosing is such that the projector will, will, will just take the largest singular value and forget about these small these zeros. So this is the nature of this bound and is just a worst case bound and there's nothing to worry here. Okay. As is it the is it the it is the worst case, it would also be the most general, but sometimes it would be loose. And here comes the summary of recent development of what we know about the Lee Robinson bound in parallel systems. Okay. So it was proven recently by myself, Lucas, and also Kurohawa uh, and Saito that there exists a strictly linear light cone when alpha is greater than 2d plus 1. And here, strictly linear, it really means at some finite values of alpha, the light cone is, is linear with some polynomial decaying tail. Okay. This comes as a bit of a surprise that this was not known. People thought it might be a, a, like a more of a quasi poly, like a polynomial growth, but in fact, it's strictly linear. And the proof techniques is quite crazy. It takes a lot of pages but the physics, physics can be ex explained later. Okay. We're, we're going to explain the intuition later. Okay, if you move beyond uh, alpha equal to 2d plus one, then the light cones start changing. So it's not going to be linear. It's going to be kind of a bit faster than that. So you're going to be t, t roughly equal to r to the eta. Okay, it still feels kind of power law. A power uh, like algebraic, okay. So this part, people are not totally sure what is the perfect exponent. Although people know it is, um, it is quasi-local. It has some parallel exponent eta. But if you pass below alpha equal to two d, okay, then the information spread out a lot faster. It becomes kind of exponentially fast. Okay, so this was proving the Hayes coma a while ago. Okay, and below alpha to equal to d, the this model becomes non-extensive, and things are not. And I think we don't have in a, a complete picture of what's happening there. So, and today we will also not talk about those too much. Okay. Today we'll be focusing 
more on this alpha greater or equal to 2D, these quasi-local light cones, okay? And what's nice is that in fact, in fact, these, this phase diagram, that's non-local, quasi-local to local, all these transition points, like alpha equal to D, alpha equal to 2D, alpha equal to 2D plus one, is in fact tight, okay? So there are protocols that saturate, saturate this bound. And it was proposed like in the last month that, that we, can, we can saturate them by preparing a GHZ-like state. And in fact, I can quickly explain why this is 2D plus one. So this picture is up already, but now, but now let me, let me say that again. So consider the interaction between two spheres of radius R separated order R away. Then if we sum over all the interaction terms, Okay, if you assume, and so in the, in the worst case bound, they all just add up linearly, then this is the expression we get. It's going to be proportional to the volumes, okay, R to the Ds, and also times their interaction strengths. And if alpha equal to 2D plus one, then this thing will be weaker. And if alpha is, is smaller than 2D plus one, this one will be strong, okay? And of course, the, the, the full proof is quite technical. I'll try to highlight um, some interesting points uh, just now, okay? But this, this picture that captures the interaction between two, two, two spheres of radius R is quite essential. And let's try to explain a bit more on what happens. Okay. So what is the physics when you have long and short range uh, Hamiltonian? Okay. So this object exponential IHS plus HLT. Okay, we have this long range one and this short range one. Okay. And the key idea that was realized by Kuhawa and Saito is that we should, we should use the interaction picture to expand this exponential, okay? And now the, this Hamiltonian evolution have two piece. There's this short range piece and also some long range piece, although it gets a bit more complicated due to the interacting picture. And what that means is that this long range interaction gets smeared out. As we see this again, looks very much, this is just a Heisenberg evolution and these exponential IHST, this evolution using the short range term is going to spread the operator. Okay. And it's going to spread both ends. And originally the operators only supported on these two points, but now you get like this huge support. Okay. So remember that there's still a lot of these other long range, long range terms and each of them actually got smeared out. Okay. And now after being smeared out, you can ask what's the interaction strength between two points. Then accounting all these smearing effects, again, you arrive as this integral, this integral over two spheres of volume R separated about order R away. So again, you get something like R2D minus alpha.
Okay, with this picture in mind, as these all these terms are being smeared out, it's been hard. It's a it's a bit hard to distinguish all of them so easily. There's like some length scales of R that you can they kind of just overlap. Okay. And this motivate this decomposition of Hamiltonian. So since they spread out, so we might as well just, just kind of regroup them. And this greatly reduce the structure of the Hamiltonian. In the beginning, there are all these long range interact, there are all these all to all interactions. And there are just so many of them. And it's not clear what we should do with them. But now it seems that the physics is that these long range interaction term actually smeared out. And so we can safely kind of regroup some of them together. For example, in this uh, long range, in this orange piece, there are hops like this, there are also hops like this. Okay, so these are all the longer hops. But although they, these two look quite different, but after smearing out, they kind of all get quite a big support. So at this level, it becomes kind of similar. So it is, this is why we kind of safely put them in one big blob and just say, okay, this is one big, huge Hamiltonian. And let's just take this operator norm of the sum of all these guys. And it turns out we're not losing so much and this bounce is saturated by protocols. If we, after we do this decomposition, then there are not so many scales remain. Okay, so there's this shortest one coming from the spin chain. Okay. There's also this uh, long, long range one due to long range interaction. So there's a competition of between these two where the shortest one give the linear light cone and the long range one would give, um, would give different behavior depending on the exponent alpha. If alpha is super big, then this would be super weak compared to the spin chain. Then it wouldn't change the light cone except at some decaying tail. But if alpha is quite small, especially smaller than 2d plus one, then these pieces actually stronger Then it would actually dominate the propagation. Okay, but still to analyze all these terms is a bit uh, tricky. Okay. But just very, very roughly speaking, what Kurohawa and Saito did is to try to piece all these scales together. And there are a lot of this recursion to do. So start with the shortest range, you can add another range inside that's intermediate. Okay. And if we manage to understand this Hamiltonian, up to length scales, up to certain length scale, we can add yet another length scale in. And so it roughly looks like some uh, this recursive application of Hamiltonian, whereas we're adding the, when we add these bigger range, we, we're kind of inter, in, in the interacting picture of all the previous lengths. Okay. The full analysis of this is takes about 40 pages. Okay. But the idea I want to get at is that this long range interaction has its best when it's carried by the small ones. Namely, if you start with one, this one operator here and you evolve it at the very short time scales, you can only care about the short range one because they're just stronger. But after a while, when your operators spread, spread out a little bit, then it becomes advantageous to use these longer hops. And this phenomena happens recursively. And, these operate, and then you just keep using longer and longer hops. Okay. And if the, uh, if the exponent alpha is more than 2d plus one, then this process actually gain you an advantage. 
So this picture, although look kind of vague, it, it is actually captured by a protocol uh, proposed by, by, by Min and all a, a month ago to recursively create a GHZ-like state. So I didn't put all the, the, the protocol, the details of the protocol, but roughly speaking, it is exactly what we just said. You recursively create these states and by using this long range interaction, you can efficiently uh, spread the states out. Okay. And in the end, from you get a GHC state from one to entire to the entire system. Okay. And this really just matched the analysis we gave. So each of these terms is spelled R to the R divided by alpha. Which is exactly the same calculation that show up so many times. Okay. okay. So this protocol also implied you can transfer a, a state pretty fast if you just run it backward with some reflection. So th if this is your input state, you get your state at some other end of your quantum computer. Okay. Okay, and I want to connect this to idea. So I was claiming to you that these Lebrons and bounds constrained state transfer. But but for the state transfer, we in the in the Schrodinger picture, but Lebrons and bounds is in the Heisman picture, and I would like to connect them uh, more formally. So this is our setup. So if we accept there's some protocol of or capable of transferring a state. And what we mean by that is that we fix all these background qubits. Okay, we initialize them to be zero while we keep these one qubits of freedom that we can choose. And we want that degree of freedom to be like perfectly uh, recovered here, okay. And how this notion connects the Robinson bounds? Okay, so how, how do we do that? We apply another U, uh, a U dagger here. And the circuits now, okay, so what's happened? So your qubit is now going to be transferring along this pipeline, okay? And you're, if you apply some operator here, why? It's equivalent to applying just is just applying to the qubit, okay. So what it tells us is that uh, these, um, these u, y, u dagger, this y of t, in fact, is just non-commuting with um, any, oper any oper operator you put here, okay. And this is exactly what we what we are saying for the Lee Robinson bounds, the commutator does not vanish for a particular states. Okay. So this this notion of state transfer with specific uh, auxiliary qubits can be constrained by the Lee Robinson bound. So let me just sum, summarize what happens. So, so I just told you that there are all these, these values of alphas, 2d plus one and 2d and d. And they're different, they're, the light cone becomes uh, this faster and faster. And there are also protocols that saturate them. Okay, so any questions so far? Otherwise, we're going to move on to the next light cone. Okay. 
So the, net, the next light cone is the Frobenius light cone. We call it the average case. So this is the quantity that we defined for this light cone. So it might look a bit complicated, but this is what usually people usually call as OTOC. And it was it is widely studied in these high energy physics or, or, or chaos dynamics. Okay. Okay, but in a nutshell, this is really just the root mean squared of the singular values. Okay, so this is the average case. And in comparison, the Libramisen bounds takes, uh, it, it gives you the largest singular value. So these two are the different behavior, okay? So for example, uh, for a projector, the worst case bound and the average case bound differs by a lot. Okay, although they're the same for poly operator. Okay. So now that I told you that one is an average case, one is the worst case, and no wonder they would be different. Okay. And here is the summary of results for what people know about these Forbenius bounds. And surprisingly, is all these results are extremely uh, recent is all within 2020. So the, the first light cone for for Benius bounds, it's proven to be at least for alpha greater or equal to 2d to 3d divided by 2 plus 1. So this is a different value. This is a different value from what we had. We, we had uh, this 2d plus 1 for the Robinson bounds. Therefore, the average case behavior differ from the worst case. Okay. In the average case, the light cone persists for uh, a, a bigger range of alpha. Okay. But then if you go below that, we're not exactly sure about the transition point, but we know it becomes uh, quasi-local. This was proven a month ago. But, but after alpha below D, we, don't, we still don't know what happens. Okay. So there are kind of th two points of transition. One is about three, three, three D over two plus one, and here is about D. And these, these two points are not exactly clear. We only know that they must be below that value, okay? And um, okay, and let me briefly explain why this is the case. Again, we show this our favorite picture: the interaction between two spheres of radius r separated r away. And here, due to the norm we're choosing, because we're using the two norm. This interaction strings is actually, they don't add up linearly, okay? Although we have so many terms, there is some kind of root mean square behavior again. And that is what gives rise to the 3D divided by two. Okay. Okay, but, but, that's, but this is just heuristic. Uh, the detailed proof takes a lot of pages. And in comparison, these the Robinson bounds, the this the corresponding sum is all linear. Just they just build up uh, linearly, as they're the worst case scenario, and that gives rise to alpha roughly equal to two d. Okay. And perhaps the more interesting point is that these this more stricter light cone, this different notion of light cone, would constrain a different. Uh, state transfer protocol where we emphasize the auxiliary qubits can now be unspecified. Okay, so if we look at this, this diagram, what we're saying is that 
Not only I want to transfer my qubits this way, I also want it to hold for any input, for any auxiliary qubits. Okay, so this is stronger than what we had before. Before we only demanded to be fixed uh, with these fixed zeros, but now we allow it to be arbitrary input. And then if we go to the Heisenberg picture, okay, we put this U dagger, then if we want this to commute with any state we put in, that re it remains the same, then, then this actually this operator just is really just commuting with any everything on the qubits. So in fact, this stronger equality just holds. Okay. And that would just imply that the Forbunius norm is pretty much unchanged. So therefore, and therefore this is constrained by the Forbunius norm. Okay. Okay, just a bit of comparison. The left hand side is the Forbunius norm bound and the right hand side is the operator norm bound. Then one of them allow initialization the other out of them have to work for all inputs. And this is this is um, coinciding with that the Ramsen bounds is the worst case bound that only works for certain state, while the Forbinian's norm is a bound that works for a lot more states. Okay. So here again is the conclusion for the Forbinius bound. There's two values of alphas. Okay. And unfortunately, we don't have a protocol to saturate them. And let's move on to the last uh, light cone. So this so-called single particle light cone is perhaps less to discuss. Uh, in all this literature. People usually care about this multi-particle physics because it seems a bit cooler, I guess. But surprisingly, the single particle, the, the single particle dynamics is, is not very much constraint that people don't understand them. But only recently people put this, we get these bounds and also protocols to understand its behavior. And for the single particle uh, dynamics, the critical value of alpha is d plus one and d. Okay. And, and so the picture somehow is quite simple. You have some linear light cone and some polynomial light cone and then nothing else. Okay. And these are all saturated by explicit protocols. So these are all typed. Okay, and and once again we go we'll go back to this picture to explain um, to explain why we get different values of alphas. So it is due to this uh, this single particle Hilbert space that the sum of the interaction between all these terms are a lot weaker than the multi-particle case. They really is the root mean square. Okay, so you get some R to R to alpha minus D instead of alpha minus 2D. Okay. And the rigorous proof of this use um, some, some recent, some, formally, some formalism recently introduced so-called operator quantum walk by Andy Lucas, but I will not go into that here. But using this, this interact, the, the interaction between two spheres, we do get an explanation of all these exponent for different light cones. So it is like D, 2D, 3D divided by two. Okay. And let me just quickly show you the saturating protocol. And since it's single particle, it's not it's not a crazy to understand. 
So I can spread my particle from one side to two side using this hopping Hamiltonian. I could also do that again by using kind of um, this more of a long range interaction. And, and this term exactly is roughly scales at r to the d minus alpha. So these match match the these interaction strings we just mentioned. And this protocol can be do to be used recursively to spread a particle into all the qubits. You can also use you can also run it backwards to transfer that qubit. Okay. So we arrive at, so this is all I want to show you. Um, okay, does it show? Yeah, okay. So here is a conclusion of all the things I just told you. Okay, so there are these different notions of light cones. There's the Robinson light cone, which is the worst case bound, or also the LTOC for Benius norm, which is the average case bound and also this single particle bound. Each of them has different structure of the light cone that depends differently on the parameter alpha. Okay, so if we look at the transition point from local to quasi-local, then, okay, we can draw this line here. Then they're really at different points, okay. And there's some regime such that one of them is local, but the other one becomes logarithmic. Okay, so for example, here, the Lee Robinson bound, the worst case bound, has be already becomes logarithmic, but other ones still remain strictly local. Okay, so this is pretty interesting. Okay, um, but if you look at the transition between quasi-local to non-local, things bit things lines up. So they all happens more or less at alpha equal to d. Below which we don't have too much to say. And we just because it becomes non-extensive, it's kind of weird. But there's two um yeah, but this is a comparison between the three cases. Okay, and finally, we also tell we also talks about each of these different norm correspond to certain physics, different physics. So for the operator norm for the Lee Robinson bounds, it constrains state transfer. For the for, De, for Benius norm, it it constrains a more special kinds of state transfer. Okay, and let me point out the missing pieces of this picture. So there's just a lot, there's some things that's not proven yet. Okay. So I think one of the things that I think several group of us probably working on is to prove the, the exponent of the quasi-local light cone for the Ramson bounds. Okay, so there are some, some estimates of this eta but we believe it's alpha minus 2d, but it's yet to be proven. Okay, so similar things for this parallel exponent is the same for, for Benius norm. Okay. But for, for Benius norm, this values of alpha is, bit, is still not clear. Okay, but otherwise, more or less for these these points on the for for Lebron bounds and for single particle bound it's more or less known these these critical alphas okay okay and I think that's pretty much all I want to say and is there any questions? Right, thank you very much for a great talk. Um, I do have a question. It's 
let's see if other people have more questions, but I wanted to ask you, um, so the Frobenius norm and the operator norm are just yeah. two particular example of a family of like shut and P norms, right? You could, you could exactly, interpret yeah. parameter. Um, do you have, all right, have you thought about this like intermediate cases? If you choose a norm, which is between the Frobenius and the operator norm, can you say something and use the same techniques? Do you think it would, it would go through or is it very specific? On, on the fact that the Frobenius norm is, is, the, is like a Hilbert space norm. Or... So, so that's true. So if people study these two norms because they're the easiest, because it's just a, it's, it has a vector space interpretation. And in fact, that the fact that there's an inner product helps a lot. And the reason why people start with the, this uh, Lee Robinson is infinity norm is because it's like the worst case and you just, and in the worst case, you you just you just use you just use triangle and quality here and there and just don't care about the structure at all. So the intermediate case, people may have some very initial thoughts, but no results are known yet. Because the geometry of this P norm is probably quite kind of weird. And only recently I think um, some techniques become more more available, but yeah, the P norm is pretty hard. But indeed, if they were found, they would constrain different physics. Right, thanks. We have a few minutes left if somebody wants to ask questions. Otherwise, oh, Spears, let's hear from Spears. Okay, hi, can you uh, hear me? Good. Um, great talk. Great, uh, great work, Anthony. That's very awesome to see this, uh, this new Libromson and bounds. It's taken a long time to get to the linear light cone in the uh, polynomial decay case. So well done. Um, one of the, the questions. So when, when we had worked out the, you know, with Michael Fosfeg and uh, Alexi Gorskov, the uh, the results from 2014, um, we had gotten a logarithmic light cone, which you, you mentioned there. But uh, you said that you expect between 2D and 2D plus 1 for the yeah. eta to be alpha minus 2D. Um, how would you explain this little phase transition to from you know um, alpha minus 2D when it becomes 2D and below like to logarithmic? Oh, but so I think that point is not a uh, like it's not very singular. And just because if you do the integral, usually, so when you do the integral, you get this limit when you have this exponent. Or sorry, uh, let me just write. Uh, so you get some alpha minus two d, and it, in fact, it comes from some kind of integral. And and roughly it becomes our like this kind of thing if the exponent starts vanishing. So, so it's, it's, uh, I see. But it's not singular. Yeah, it's not singular. Okay. So there is there's still the one over R. It's not just one, right? So there, there is, would you expect yeah, that you get closer to 2D, it becomes closer to logarithmic or yeah, because otherwise it looks like, um, as alpha approaches 2D, that integral DR would be um, yeah, I guess maybe maybe I'm missing something here. So, so your question is that why is the there's so many things between D and two D? Um, specifically, I guess what happens when alpha is equal to two D? So this so, so crossing this point is fine. Just just like the integral is there's some there's not there's not a singular transition of the integral. Of the integral of uh, so of so if we do this r d minus one d r r d minus one d r divide by uh, r to the alpha, then it will go to something like this because the, all these exponent cancels out and you remain with like a dimensionless integral. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And this is also saturated by protocols. 
So it seems at least this part uh, around this transition point seems okay. Sounds good. I think I see. Yeah. Okay. There is one last question um, from Diego. I'm not sure I'm parsing the question correctly. So let me try to read it to you. Um, he's asking, according to application of the light cones, we could apply a signal in a black hole, preferably supermassive one. I guess you can you, like sending a signal inside the black hole is the question. I'm not sure I understand the question correctly, Diego. So if you want to. Um, I don't know. Um, John, do you had a question too, you wanted to speak. Yeah, hi, Anthony, great talk. Um, hi. You mentioned some open issues at the end, but did I, did I understand correctly that it's also open whether there's a matching protocol in the Frobenius case? Yeah, that's right. But you you believe that your results are tight in the Frobenius case or you think it's- um, Oh. Um, let me go back. Um, okay. Yeah, so for the Frobenius norm, I don't think, I think, I think most things are just not tight. So not only the, the transition point between local and quasi local is not tight, and also this exponent is not tight. And also what happened after alpha equal to D is also not known. Mm -hmm. And just because um, this Forbinius norm, it, it's, it's kind of not, it doesn't feel like pure states. So usually this protocol we have are more like pure states, but here we have to deal with operator because if we want the Forbinius norm to be big, it's kind of have to have, uh, it's more like Pauli's. And those protocols seems a bit harder to write down. Okay, thanks. I'm not sure if answer the question. All right, I would say if Diego wants to ask his question, otherwise uh, we can move over to the other town. Diego. Okay, I don't know what's going on, but so let's 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 cut the recording here and